thank you for your presence here today. And Lord, as we continue in your presence, we thank you for sure. Thank you for this woman of God, Lord, who is one who seeks after your heart and seeks after your truth, Lord. And we thank you that you have given her word to speak to us today. Lord, we bring it to you. We bring surely to you. We pray for the power of the Holy <coughs> Spirit to flow through her. The, the words which come forth, Lord, will accomplish everything that you desired in our lives today. In Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we just pray for Shirley right now, Lord. We just pray that the word will come out of her mouth, that your mouth will sure be, Father. And we just bring in the power, Father. We just ask Thank you, Lord. forward will that help a bit I don't know that a word is necessary today <laughs> we've just been drenched in the presence of God we've just had such a, a feast in his presence I just feel full to overflowing and, uh, and what an anointing on the worship just wonderful and uh, it's almost it's, he's spoken to us in the prophetic word that we've had encouragement it's like my job's over I could go home now <laughs> and also as I look around and I see you know your lovely faces and faces I recognize and love and some I haven't met before but you know I can see the the love of God radiating out of each one and there's such a sense of God's presence in each one of you and uh, that also makes me think, what's the point in speaking? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I join my thanks to you for praying um, a couple of weeks ago when Grace was uh, so poorly, especially on that Saturday morning. I thank you for that. And I thank Matt also and Heather for filling in the gap when that I was supposed to be leading worship on that day. But... As you know, God works all things to good, and I'd just like to say that because I haven't led worship in six weeks now, I now have nails. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> they get smashed up on the keyboard every week, but it's just wonderful. I look to them and say, Grace, I've got nails. <laughs> oh, dear. Where's the word? Where is it? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Oh, God uses every single thing to speak to us, doesn't he? Yes. You know, he uses all things. I, I've always, you know, bleated. God speaks through the, through the natural of the supernatural things. He speaks of the invisible through that which is visible to us. And um, so often he uses a picture uh, to, in, in the word of God as we read it, he use a, uses a picture to describe what it is he's trying to say. And um, it's, it's, it's because he wants us to get it. You know, really, we can be quite dull. Remember what he said to the disciples? Are you so dull that I have to stay with you? You know, we don't get it. We, we struggle sometimes to understand what it is he's saying. So he speaks in different ways. Uh, when, when Grace and Sam were little, and I'm sure all, all the mothers here can um, remember, uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, and the horn on the bus goes beep, beep, beep. You know, it, it was all to teach our children what it was we met that the horn goes beep and the wheels go round and the bell goes ding. You know, these kind of um, things, pictures and uh, ways of teaching us. And God is exactly the same. And he uses allegory, which is a story, poem or picture which can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. He uses parable, which is uh, a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. He uses similes, which are comparisons of one thing with another thing. He uses analogy, which is um, a comparison between one thing and another thing. Now, I'm sure that that's pretty, pretty close, but it's a, a, a comparison between. And a metaphor, which is a word or phrase which is applied to an object or action 
to which it is not literally applicable. So I know that you know what I'm talking about here because we can all, we all know that Yeshua spoke in parables, that he spoke in a way that was often completely hidden to the hearers, to the listeners. They couldn't see it, they couldn't get it at all because he spoke in a way that only those who really sought him and who were hungry for him and desperately wanted to know, rather like us here, did it all become clear. I often wonder actually why he did it that way. Why didn't he make it easier for us all to get it? You know, it's sometimes quite <laughs> difficult, isn't it? I don't understand this Bible. I, I understand an awful lot more than I did 25 years ago when I got saved, but I still don't understand it. And I'm still learning and um, I guess we all are. But you know, he wants to get his message across to us. He wants us to understand what he means and he wants us to know how he feels about things. He wants us to understand how he is, how he would describe himself, his attributes, his features. He wants us to know. And so he uses all manner and means to get our attention. Pictures and comparisons, you know, so that when we're reading words, we see more in our mind's eye than the words that we're reading and that we can get a, a better idea of who he really is. For instance, did you realize that there are over 50 references in the Bible to God with a capital R calling himself a rock? It's an amazing picture, isn't it? That he is the rock, I am the rock. 50 times he describes himself as this immovable strength there from the beginning. He's the water of life. He's the bread of life. He's a refiner's fire, a launderer's soap, a capstone, a firm foundation, to name just a few. Are you getting the picture? When you think of a launderer's soap, my mother used to use that, that fairy soap in a big green block. And if you rubbed your hands with it, it took your skin off. <laughs> So you immediately understand that he's not soft and gentle, like fairy liquid. <laughs> he's a launderer's soap and he's there to get the dirt off us and to uh, be abrasive. He also uses the same manner and means to describe his enemies. Not in quite the same uh, way, but he describes our enemy, his enemy, Satan, in many, many different ways. A serpent, a scorpion, a deceiver, a snake. He also describes the places of the enemy as deserts and swamp lands, etc., etc., etc. And he also uses terms to dis describe his loved ones in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. I certainly wouldn't choose some of the descriptions that he uses in this word to describe his beloved people. Psalm 80. Starting at verse 4, it says, O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbours and our enemies mock us. So what has changed? <laughs> Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we might be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it and the creatures of the field feed on it. Return to us, O Lord God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. 
Your vine is cut down, it is burnt with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Verse eight says, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove the nations out and you planted it. Obviously, that scripture refers to Exodus. It refers to the people of Israel, the Hebrews who were gathered in Egypt, who had been sent down into Egypt, and who had found themselves in slavery, and uh, toil, and labor, and misery. But all the time, God was looking at them, wasn't he? All the time he had his eye on them, he had his ears listening out as they cried out in agony to him to rescue them from their cruel masters. They were unable to do anything but hard labor and bear lots and lots and lots of children. All the while that they were there, toiling away in misery and cruelty, he was seeing them as a vine. Would you have seen them as a vine in that situation? I don't think I would, and I'm certain Pharaoh didn't. He describes them as a vine, which he brought out of Egypt, a living organism, a plant, which when located in the right place, would send down roots and grow strong and bring forth fruit. Isaiah 5 is, is a lovely scripture it's a, a, a song about the vineyard. Verse 7 says, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. That whole scripture, if you... Uh, it starts off with, I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared its stones and planted it with the choicest vines, etc., etc. God really cares about his vineyard. He really loves his vine, which he declares is his people, Israel. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty, verse 7, is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. Mm -hmm. And again, in Psalm 52, verse 8, God describes his people as an olive tree. He says, but I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. The writer knows that the, the nature of his life is likened to that of an olive tree, which is flourishing, which is growing, sending down deep roots, um, bringing forth leaf and fruit in its proper appointed time because he is anchored and present in the house of God. I got to thinking about that. God has described his people as vines and as olive trees and it's just interesting because when you think about it we all know the scripture that we're grafted in to the olive tree don't we Romans 11 verse 17 Romans 11 says if some of the branches have been broken off and you though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. And verse 24, after all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So God uses a simile. He uses a picture 
to describe both Israel and Gentiles, doesn't he? And it's interesting that, that the root doesn't, in the main, know him. The root of the olive tree doesn't know him any more than the vineyard knows him. Those who have come to, to know Yeshua, obviously, as Gentile and as Jew, know that they are a part of the vine, they are a part of the olive tree. We're grafted into both. <coughs> it's fair to say, I think, that if we're grafted into the olive tree, that we are grafted into the vine. Would you agree? It's the same picture. You know, the first reference to a vine of any sort in the, in the scriptures that I've been able to find is, uh, is in uh, Genesis, verse 20. Um, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. He's been through the building of the ark. Anybody watched Evan Almighty? That's a great film. It really brought that whole process of what it must have been like for him to build this ark. And how long it took him, I, I haven't researched, but, you know, a massive enterprise and how stupid he must have felt at times and how reviled and mocked he must have been. So he's been in with all the animals in the ark, 40 days and 40 nights on the sea, and the dove has been sent out and brought back a branch of what? Olive. An olive. And he has, God has blessed Noah and his sons. And he has told them to be fruitful and to multiply. And he establishes his covenant with Noah. And he promises never again to destroy the earth and its inhabitants. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful for that promise because... I think we deserve that sort of eradication, just as uh, it was in those days. Thank you, Lord, that you're not going to do it again. Mm. And he says to God, go and be fruitful and multiply. <coughs> the first thing that Noah does is to plant a vineyard. Now, there are approximately 200 references to vines and vineyards and wine in the Bible. In the scriptures. And interestingly enough, and I, I just found this interesting, vines, vineyards, or wine is mentioned in every single book of the, of the Tanakh except Obadiah. And all I can conclude is that he must have been a teetotaler. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he was. I don't know. Because wine is another allegorical or metaphorical description which God uses to make his point. And as those who were present at the Joel study a few years ago now know, wine is considered to be a blessing of the Lord. Now I know that some of us choose not to drink wine and that's absolutely fine. But God views it as a blessing for his people. And it's also a means to honor him through the Passover cup, through the communion cup. Yeshua demonstrated at Passover that the wine represented his blood. And every Friday night and every two weeks here when we take communion, we drink the wine as a representation, as a symbol of his blood that cleansed us, that washed over us. So wine is a really good thing, but wine is not what I'm really talking about today. Why am I talking about olive trees and vineyards? Well, I thought I would like to tell you a parable today and see if you get it. <laughs> you know, we've been on holiday this last couple of weeks and um, we, because Grace was, was poorly, we were unable to go away. So we hunkered down and we just didn't answer the phone. Sorry if you rang us, but we didn't answer the phone. We didn't answer emails hardly. We, were, we just decided that we would act in the same way as if we had taken the caravan, gone down to Hereford and set up there. And uh, we actually had a, a very nice restful time. It was, it was good. And um, 
One of the, uh, the things that, that, that happened was that we had a swarm of bees come into uh, a bait box, which was uh, in the bottom of the garden. That happened um, actually just pardon? on the Saturday when I was here thanking you for prayers. I got, I got out and Grace said, that I had a text saying, there's a swarm going into the bait box. And apparently it was so loud that it was like a roar. And it, the, the width of the, the swarm was the width of our garden. It was massive. How many bees were there in it? About 10,000 bees. Well, our neighbors, <laughs> they get very nervous. Oh, there's lots of bees next door. Can you hear the bees? Can you hear the bees? <laughs> uh, but after a while, they, well, after they, they come around the bait box and they go around it and then they just go into it one after the other over the top. It's just amazing to watch. Grace got to watch this one. It's just incredible. So that was a blessing. And so Michael has been engaged in beekeeping all holiday. I don't think there's been a single day where we haven't done something or there hasn't been somewhere to go or something to do regarding bees. But we also managed to get a small amount of honey this year. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because we didn't have a spot last year with the weather. So that's really good. Pray for some more. And then you might get some. <laughs> But also, I was actually really glad in one way that we didn't go away, because the period that we would have been away exactly matched the coming to fullness of our raspberry canes. Exactly. They weren't really quite right a week ago last Friday. They weren't quite right. But by Monday, they would be getting red. And um, so we've spent most of fortnight as well, picking raspberries. Now I'm not a gardener. <laughs> Anybody will tell you that I am not a gardener. Um, at our wedding, um, the man who married us, who knew me very, very well, said in his speech, Shirley is not a gardener. <laughs> Her idea of gardening is lying on a chaise lounge with a large gin and tonic and watching the <laughs> <laughs> I don't get the gin and tonic nowadays. <laughs> I don't enjoy it. I don't, I'm not a natural gardener. I have gardened. I have made myself go and till the soil. I have made myself go and plant the seeds and grow things, but it's not me. It's not what I like to do. Michael likes to do it, but uh, you know, it's, it's not my thing. I'd rather, I'd rather somebody came in with a, a bunch of produce, you know, vegetables and nice things, and I'll make endless food dishes with it, but I don't want to go and grow it, thank you very much. And actually, the courgettes are just coming through, so that'll be nice, and the green beans are due in a couple of weeks' time, so um, that's, that's, I'm looking forward to that aspect of things. But la the last two weeks have been raspberries, 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 what can we do with these raspberries? My freezer is full with raspberries. I've made raspberry jam and raspberry jelly and he's now making raspberry cordial and raspberry framboise and, and they're still growing. <laughs> I understand that grapevines can be really aggressive plants. I'm, I, I've read a little bit about them and I understand that they can really take over a place, that they throw out these um, uh, shoots all over the place and then these, these grapevines grow up everywhere and they have to be hacked back, you have to hack the roots back apparently. And um, it's, it's, it's a little bit the same in our, our garden because we, we bought 12, 12 canes about three years ago and we put them in a neat row uh, in, a, in a, a raised bed and they were very nice and neat weren't they? And then uh, next year there was just a few more well now, they're everywhere. They're literally, they've come out of that box and they're in the next raised bed. They've jumped over and they're underneath the tree and they're all the way around there and all the way at this garden. So everywhere you look is raspberries. <laughs> Rampant. <coughs> and when you go and pick raspberries, who has picked raspberries here? Most of you. Then most of you can understand what I'm going to say. And if you can't, then you'll get the picture you know what I mean? Because some of them grow up really high. You know, the, the, the plants are this high, so to get the raspberries, you've got to, to, to almost need a stepladder for them to get them. 
Some of them are different colours. They grow on different types of, of, um, of not vine, it's cane they're called, aren't they? And some of the canes die and the fruit is wonderful and some of the canes die and the fruit's horrible. Some of the canes <laughs> that are beautiful, the fruit dies on and then some of the, the canes that are still rich and lush, the fruit is lush. You can't, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And then <coughs> you have to lift up the leaves to find them. So you, you go around them and you pick them all and then you just go like this and there's a whole load, basket load more of them. And then you, you pull them apart and there's a load more. And then you just look at them from this direction and behold, there's loads more. You have to look at, from, at them from every angle. You have to search for them and be diligent, I think. And we've got them growing on top of a log stack, because you know that Michael is a, a passionate logger. <laughs> and we have, as well as raspberry canes in our garden, we have stacks of logs everywhere. And so the, the canes which have put their shoots out, unfortunately, underneath the logs, have had a real hard job growing. But they've done it. <laughs> we've got a log stack this high. And the log stack is over, over a compost heap there. And then there's logs all the way down there. And I had to step on the logs in order to get up to reach the, 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 the canes, the raspberries that were up right up the top there. I couldn't believe that they could struggle through logs to get to that place. And you know what? Those were the raspberries that were growing as double raspberries. A double portion. There was loads of them. Handfuls of double portion raspberries. And then you go to the raspberries on the right hand side. I know, I know it's boring, but I'm telling you this story whether you want it or not. <laughs> on the right hand side, you, you, you go to pull a raspberry and you pull a nettle so you get stung all at your arms. So you have to watch out for the nettles and pull them. And then there's mint everywhere, growing, you know, the same height as the metals everywhere. So you have to watch out for the mint as well. And with these poor things, they've all been battered down with the rain. The rain came, the wind came, and these all fell on the floor. So if you want to get them, you have to get down on your knees and pull them up to get them. You also need to be really careful because if you brush past them too strongly, too harshly, or if you pull one too quickly or hard, then the whole spray comes off and you've got two ripe ones and 15 green ones. And you think, oh, what a waste. So we've harvested the fruit and you know what, the cane that those raspberries grew on will never, never produce fruit again. It's going to be cut down in the autumn as it dies, and the plant will have sent out its, its um, suckers already, its new shoots, and they will appear in the spring, and the new growth will come on the new shoots. And it's a parable, but it's a story to illustrate a spiritual or a moral meaning because God really spoke to me as I was harvesting these raspberries because for a start, I didn't really want to do it. I, was look I wanted it to be easy. <laughs> I just wanted them all to be lined up and just go bop, 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 <laughs> and, and not have to, to get myself up to my elbows inside a raspberry cane plot. I didn't want to have to do that. And I didn't want to have to stand on the logs. And I didn't want to have to reach high. And I didn't want to get stung. And I didn't want to get crawled over by, you know, <coughs> flies and wasps and spiders, because they're all on the raspberries as well. And did you know we had a, uh, that the birds have been having an absolute feast. In fact, one blackbird ate so many 
that it couldn't fly. <laughs> it just, it just... <laughs> and it, it conked out, didn't it? It actually died. And now there's a meaning to that, isn't there? A parable in that. It died. It couldn't fly. And it died, bless it. I spent so many raspberries this heart gave out. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Now, Yeshua spoke about vines to his disciples. He talked to them in all manner of means, and he used vines, because we're going back to vines now. He spoke about them. And remember that he was speaking to his disciples who were Jews. They weren't Gentiles, like in the main, you and I. They were Jews. They grew up with vines growing next to their house providing shade. They knew exactly how a vine grew. They knew exactly how to cultivate it, when to water it, when to prune it, when to pull it down, when to cut that invasive shoot off. They knew all about vines. And they also, when he spoke about vines, understood their identity as a vine because they knew the scriptures. They knew Psalm 80, verse 7, I think it was we read out. Four, oh yes, yeah, seven it was, wasn't it? Where he says, I brought a vine out of Egypt. They knew that God looked upon them as a vine. So when Jesus, when Yeshua started talking to them about being a vine, they understood it. John 15 is the scripture. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Amen. Whilst gathering the raspberries, 
God spoke to me about the necessity to undergo the pruning under his hand, to allow him to have his way, because he knows the vine, he knows the fruit, he knows the nature of the plant, he knows us completely, he knows our hearts. No one else knows our heart like he does. You may think you know somebody, I may think I know somebody, but I don't know what goes on in a person's heart. You don't know what goes on in my heart. It's a sobering thought to know that God knows everything about us, good, bad, and indifferent. And he loves us, he cares for us. And this scripture speaks about Yeshua being the true vine which makes sense when we say that we're grafted into the olive stump. We're grafted into the true vine as well. We're Gentiles. We're believers in Yeshua, believers in Jesus. Yet, because we have been grafted in, we have everything through the Torah, through the prophets, through the word of God, through every scripture, through the history, through the Messiah of the Jewish people, Israel, available to us. And so when we see ourselves as grafted in, as a part, an intrinsic growing part of an olive tree or of a vine, we see, ourse we see ourselves differently. We are standing with Israel because the vine is Israel. The vine is the God of Israel. The olive tree is the God of Israel. We are in him in a way that, 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 that takes some understanding if you have no idea about God. We can understand it because we've read the scriptures and, 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 and most of us have, have an understanding of the, 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 the whole concept and principle of being grafted in. But we are in God. We are a part of him. And as Yeshua says in, um, in verse 1, I am the true vine. The true vine. He, he has the understanding of what is needed for his, for us to be fruitful, for us to um, go forth and multiply in every sense of the word. And the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua, was with the vine when they were in Egypt. He was the vine that was brought out of Egypt. He came with them and was planted with them in the promised land. And he has been with them throughout every second of their history, right up until this moment. And as Israel was cut down and destroyed so many times, and, and as so many perished throughout their history, so was he, Yeshua, cut down and destroyed. He died and was buried, but <laughs> he rose again, hallelujah, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he lives to intercede for you and for me. He knows us. He is alive. He has not died. He is alive, living as much as he was back in Egypt. They didn't know him. They couldn't see him. We know him, for we have understood who he is. We have received his Holy Spirit in our lives, and we experience him. And today we have experienced him. We have dwelt in his presence. We are in his presence now. Hallelujah. He is still their Messiah, and he is still with them, even though most of them don't know him. 
And as Revelation 22 verse 16 says, I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. He is the root. He is the stump. So it's not just Israel that we're grafted into. We are grafted into the God of Israel. Hallelujah. He identifies himself with Israel, saying he is the true vine in this John, John 15 scripture. And you know what? Yeshua makes it very clear here that he's looking for fruit. It's no good to say, I'm saved. I am going to heaven hallelujah, and sit back and do nothing. It's true that if you remain in his boundaries for the rest of your life, and you don't sin, and you remain, um, or, or you remain confessing your sin and being forgiven of your sin, that doing nothing will still get you to heaven. Because it's believing and trusting in Yeshua that gets you to heaven, not works. But we have been birthed to do things. We've been gifted to do things. We have been produced and cultivated and given a life to in order that his life can be outworked through us. And if we don't do something, if we don't make ourselves available, if we don't go to the market and speak, if we don't go and pray for that person, if we don't share the love of Yeshua to that broken person, if we don't pick up that person and take them out of the gutter, if we don't serve, in cleaning and doing the teas and in doing all the myriad jobs that is part of being in the kingdom, then what a waste of time. You may as well be a branch that is cut off and thrown into the fire. But what use are we if we don't do anything in this kingdom that God has given us? I see Yeshua is going down to the raspberry plot every day, <laughs> looking for more raspberries and looking under the leaves and thinking, ah, oh, there's another one, yes. I'm going to be doing that tonight when I get home, hopefully, because I didn't have a chance this morning. But it's, when fruit appears, it almost happens without anybody seeing, doesn't it? I went to sleep last night and that particular raspberry was green. This morning it's red. <laughs> we go to bed, we pray a prayer. We say, Lord, will you have your way with me? Will you just take my hardness, my bitterness, my unforgiveness? Would you just take this issue that I'm struggling with or this person that I'm struggling with? I give you permission to work in my life to bear fruit in this. And you wake up the next morning and it's, it's different. That's how it works. Because it's not the physical fruit, it's the heart that he's looking for. He's not looking for us to go out and, and um, find raspberries and grapes and olives for him. He's, he's, he's saying in a, a para, in a parable form, your heart is what matters to me. I want the fruit of your heart. And if you can't love me, if you can't give me every bit of your heart in surrender, every part of the person that you are, body, soul, and spirit, if you can't, then you're going to lack fruit in that area. You're not going to be able to love in the way that I would have you love. Because it is about love. God is love. And he has created each one of us to love. It's not just about love, but love comes first. I love God. We were singing such wonderful truths today. All I need is you. 
you are my all in all. Mm -hmm. I love you, I love you, I love you. And for me, it's the complete truth. And in the middle of it, I'm singing, I surrender. I need more of you. Holy Spirit, don't leave me. Don't leave me. It's, it's, it's an attitude of heart that brings fruit. It's, it's, it's allowing God to love us, to love him, but also to allow him to love us. It enables us to love others. It's a flowing um, thing. It, 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 it's a, like a cyclical thing. The more we love God, the more we let him love us, the more fruit we can spread of love to people. So you see the parable of what I'm saying. Verse 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. And I think this is so often misconstrued as I've got to go and do works. I've got to go and do this, 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 and this. And then once I've done that, that's it. My job is done. And I just think that is like the raspberries that are on top of the vine that, are, that produce fruit but are pecked at by, by the blackbirds, that are, are spat upon by the flies, that are sucked at by the wasps, wrapped up by the spiders. It's fruit and it, it, has a, it has a purpose but it doesn't actually reach the point, it doesn't reach the mouth. You know, I think, as I look around, I know that most of us, I believe, are the fruit that's worth looking for, searching for. You know, we have um, the Spirit of God in us. We have a church, a fellowship that loves one another, that demonstrates that. There is a, such a, a sense of God's love in this place. And so many people remark upon it when they come through the door that I know this to be truth, that there is fruit here. But for some of us, you know, we've been beaten down by the storms and we've been poured on by the rain and the wind has hammered us flat and it's sometimes difficult for, for us to, to see ourselves as ones who can stand proud and even be worthy of God's love, let alone be able to love others. And others are, are like those growing in the woodstack, that there are so many obstacles and difficulties along the way that, that no matter, you know, you, you, it's kind of the whole of life is darkness and you have the odd glimpse of light and then another obstacle comes and another obstacle and it's a constant call to overcome the obstacle and find the way up into the light. But you know what God spoke to me about that? that it was those raspberries that produced the double portion because they'd been through the compost. They'd been through the filth of life, through that which is waste. And they had found their way to the light and they had found a way to rejoice in creation and to be able to give a double portion. Now God says, I will give you a double portion in the land. But I want to say to God, I want to give you a double portion. I want to be one who doesn't just give the required amount. I want to overflow. In the same way as his cup, for me, overflows. And I can say, I am truly blessed. My cup overflows. I want to be a cup that overflows for him, that spills out over people that I meet. And that is a, a fruit that I can't necessarily tell I'm producing, but that other people perceive, because this is the thing, you don't perceive it. You don't know how people are seeing you, or what, what blessing you're planting into somebody when you smile at them, or when you just touch them. Some people never have anybody to touch them. Some people never have a hug. They don't have anybody to hug them, and they come in here, and somebody just goes, oh, bless you, nice to see you. And it's like, wow, the 
because we don't do that in the world. So, after battle's done, after the sunshine has bound us in that situation, after the rain has reflect, refreshed us, we flourish and we produce good fruit. And it's all down to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We so need the Holy Spirit. We so need the Holy Spirit. Because I can tell you that without the Holy Spirit, we cannot remain in God. We cannot remain grafted in, held in, gripped in. We can't do it because without the Holy Spirit, we have no power. And if anybody does not have the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, have not had the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need it. It's so hard to live life without that life, the life of God, the very life of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, who chooses this body to live in and calls it the temple of the Holy Spirit. Unless you have his spirit at work in you, 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 you are more likely to fail. And lastly, those bits of our lives that we are aware do not produce good fruit. The bits of our lives that we know, that we don't tell people about, that we keep in darkness, that we hide. We know that God hasn't got lordship over that area in our lives. That that particular area, well, you know, I just, we just gloss over it. Those branches in our vine need to be cut off. We need to give them to the, the gardener, to the true vine. We need to give those things over. You've seen apple trees and pear trees and fruit trees that are pruned right back. God spoke to me so clearly this year because two years ago in the walk that I do very regularly with, Jack, with my dog Jack, there was a huge beech tree. It had a, a girth this wide. It was massive. It's been there years and years and years in the, in the woods where I walk. And one day I came along and the woodcutters had been there and they'd lopped huge 20 foot long logs from this tree and they were all strewn around. And the tree was just a trunk with that and that and that and that. Cut off like that. And I, I, it broke my heart because it was such a beautiful tree. It had an ama amazing spreading canopy. And I kind of grieved over it. And I even went to the uh, country park office and said, why did you cut that tree down? And they said, it had a rot, a rot inside it. And that if we hadn't cut it down, it could have blown down in a storm and then it could have hurt somebody. So we, we had to cut it down and we leave the logs because um, the insects and the birds feed on them as they rot down. And every time I look at it, I look at it and I think, oh, sad. This year it blossomed, yeah. it sprang oh. forth. It has a canopy of fresh green beech leaves all along the top. And it's, it's, like, it's like carrot top, you know. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And it's like my heart leapt when I saw it. Because it's two years. Two years that that pruning has taken place. That that huge tree. And it doesn't matter how high up you are in this life. It doesn't matter what your position is, or how wonderfully you do something, or how renowned and applauded you are for anything you do. God knows what needs to happen in our lives. And he knows the branches that need to be cut off because they're not producing, or because there's something rotten in them. But when he does that, when we allow him to do it, sooner or later, the growth reoccurs, it comes back. And we begin to produce fruit in a place that we didn't before.
And that's what it's about, as far as I'm concerned. We, need, we are called to produce fruit. We're called to love one another extravagantly. And we can't do it unless we're in that place of submission and surrender to God, grafted into the understanding that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of the Jew and of the Gentile. And that in loving him, he loves us more. Mm -hmm. And that we can never outlove him. We can never outgive him. We can never outwit him. <laughs> never. Some of us have tried. We can never do it. He died. He paid the price for us. His blood was shed on that cross at Calvary in order that he would purchase men for God. We have been bought at a price. We are not our own. It's no use you saying to me, I want to live my life as I want to live it. I'll say then, then forget God. Don't, don't bring God into that. If you want to live your life as you want to live it, then just leave him out of the equation. Because you're not your own. None of us are. We've been bought at a price and we've been, we have been chosen. He didn't choose, we didn't choose him. He chose us and appointed us to go forth and bear fruit that will last. And that's my prayer today. That each one of us will, will spring forth new shoots will grow new fruit, will be able to offer a double portion from the compost of our lives to God. And Father, I pray that. I just ask, Father, for every single person here that is struggling in any way, for every person here, Lord, that has a hidden place or a place unsurrendered to God, for every person who has obstacles and logs in their way, Lord, and feels as though it's such an effort to find the light. For every person who feels they're hidden behind a leaf and no one sees them. That they don't matter. My prayer, Lord, is that you, as the true vine, would pluck the fruit, Lord. That you would prune us and fashion us and care for us as the true gardener and that you would enable us to go forth and bear fruit, the fruit of love, the fruit that comes from remaining in your boundaries, from obeying your commands and, and setting our will not to sin. The fruit that comes from allowing you to love us at a deeper and deeper level. And I pray this for each one of us and I pray it for myself, Lord. That we would be Father's house, a fruitful vine in your vineyard. Amen.